outnumbered American fighter pilots battle marauding Japanese airmen to control the skies over a sweltering Pacific island called Guadalcanal. During a grueling six-month slugfest, their combat in the sky will help decide the course of the Pacific War. Through state-of-the-art computer animation, you're in the cockpit as America's rugged F-4F Wildcats face off against lethal Japanese Zero and Oscar fighters. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the dogfights of Guadalcanal. August 30th, 1942, a formation of U.S. Marine Corps F-4F Wildcats and Army P-400 Era Cobras patrol the skies over Guadalcanal. Their mission? Stop Japanese bombers and fighters threatening the American beachhead. Leading the flight is Marine Captain John L. Smith. The P-400s have no oxygen equipment and level off at 12,000 feet but Smith pushes his Wildcats above the slower and more vulnerable P-400s. Smith scans the sky for enemy aircraft, but spots nothing. Then, his radio crackles to life. Captain Smith receives a frantic radio call from one of the P-400s, whose tally on some enemy fighters that are inbound, Japanese Zeros. A swarm of more than 20 Zeros threatened the Army Air Cobras from the rear. The P-400s are here. The Zeros are here, attacking the P-400s from behind. Smith and the Wildcats are here, 3,000 feet above. The Zeros don't see them. I wouldn't say they use the P-400s as bait, but, but the P-400s normally would get in trouble, and then the Marines would come down and shoot zeros off the tails of the 400s. The Marines dive to rescue the P-400s. Captain Smith closes fast on an unsuspecting zero and takes aim. What they found is if they could aim just after the canopy towards the wing route, uh, where the wings join the fuselage of the Japanese zero, that's right about where the fuel tanks are. If they can execute a direct hit at that point, the Japanese Zero immediately burns, and oftentimes the wings fall off. Catching the Zero in a shallow left turn, he opens fire. It's Smith's sixth kill of the war, but there's no time to celebrate. The skies are still filled with Zeros, and Smith and his men are heading into six months of legendary dogfights, battling for the most important location in the Pacific in 1942. A green speck of land called Guadalcanal. Three months earlier, Allied reconnaissance discovered that the Japanese were building an airfield on Guadalcanal, a 90-mile-long jungle island at the southern end of the Solomon Island chain. If the Japanese can control Guadalcanal, they'll sever the vital supply line from the U.S. to the South Pacific. Australia and New Zealand will be open to invasion and conquest. The Allies have to act. Depending upon who controlled that airstrip uh, had a, an enormous effect on Japanese and American fortunes in that area. August 7, 1942. America launches its first amphibious assault of World War II. Over 11,000 U.S. Marines storm ashore at Guadalcanal. The Marines quickly gain a foothold on the island. By the second day, they take the Japanese airstrip, renaming it Henderson Field. The Japanese bring in thousands of fresh troops to Guadalcanal and attack the Americans relentlessly, trying to drive them off the island. The Marines fight off attacks while desperately trying to prepare Henderson Field for operations. Japanese tractors and equipment are commandeered to improve the small crushed coral runway. Bomb damage is repaired 
and PSP, perforated steel planking, is hurriedly laid down. After two weeks, they finish the airstrip and fly in 19 F-4F Wildcat fighters and 12 SBD Dauntless dive bombers. It was only because of the ability of the Americans to place aircraft on Henderson Field to protect the supply ships bringing in reinforcements and supplies to the Marines on Guadalcanal that the island could be held. Because the Allied code name for Guadalcanal is Cactus, Henderson Field becomes the home of the tiny Cactus Air Force, at first consisting of just 43 pilots and ground crew. The men of Henderson Field soon discover it isn't just the enemy making their lives hell. The island was a fly-infested, dirty, stinking, blood-soaked, damned island that uh, it was just dangerous to even walk on the beaches because there was so much unexploded ammunition around. The pilots and ground crew live in mud-floored tents. The latrine is a trench with a log seat, and the bathtub is the Lunga River, complete with crocodiles and leeches. The flyers of the Cactus Air Force are outnumbered and short on supplies. Their fighter, the F-4F Wildcat, can't match the agility of the enemy Zero. But a big advantage for the Cactus Air Force is that they are commanded by a born leader in 27-year-old John Smith. Smith's an aggressive dogfighter and skilled tactician. He always preached and devised his tactics around, you have to pit your strengths against the enemy's weakness. And that is as true today as it ever was since the first airplane ever flew in combat. Now, on August 30th, 1942, Captain John Smith and his men are protecting Guadalcanal from approaching bombers and fighters. In his eight days on the island, Smith has already scored five kills, making him an ace. Today, he's racked up one more. Then he spots another zero below, breaking from a cloud. The zero is here. Smith is here, high above him. He plans to use the Wildcat's diving speed to try and drop behind the Japanese plane. Smith first rolls inverted, then dives. This creates positive G-force instead of negative Gs. You roll on your back, pull aft on the stick, and pull positive Gs so you're pushed into your seat, you can be able to pull more Gs, which means you can pull your nose downhill faster. The maneuver works. Smith rolls back over, then levels out behind the zero, and fires. The Wildcat's six 50-caliber guns deliver 200 rounds in a four-second burst. White-hot, phosphorus-filled incendiary bullets ignite the Zero's fuel tank. But as Smith arcs away from his second victim, the Predator becomes the prey. A Japanese Zero closes in on Smith from dead ahead. High above the green jungle canopy of Guadalcanal, the planes converge at over 600 miles per hour. Think of a high-speed game of chicken going directly at your, your target, uh, and no one wants to flinch, because if you flinch, you become defensive, and you have to be pointing at the target to shoot them, so it has to be head-to-head. -head. Once in range, the Zero opens up with his 20-millimeter cannon. Smith answers with his 50 caliber machine guns. It's basically that slugfest all the way to the merge. Who's going to flinch first or who's going to blow up first? Both planes are taking hits, but Smith's Wildcat has thicker armor and he's withstanding the blows. And then the overwhelming firepower of the Navy airplane cut this guy into ribbons. He exploded. And what Smith did is dump the nose over very hard, very abruptly, and flew underneath the debris field and escaped. 
The Zero has made a fatal error. He fought the Wildcats' fight. Built by Grumman Aircraft, the Wildcat is first flown in 1937. The rugged plane features cockpit armor and self-sealing fuel tanks. These tanks are coated with layers of rubber that expand and reseal if they're punctured. The Wildcat faces the most famous of all Japanese aircraft, the deadly Mitsubishi A6 M30. The lightweight Zero can outturn and outclimb the Wildcat, a lethal advantage in a dogfight. But its thin armor protection and lack of self-sealing fuel tanks means it can't survive a slugging match with the tougher Wildcat. Essentially, in uh, fighter versus fighter combat, the difference between the Wildcat and the Zero is the difference between a battle axe and a rapier. They can both be effective, but they're used uh, somewhat differently. The Zero is faster, more maneuverable, and can outclimb the Wildcat, while the Grumman is tougher, more heavily armed, and can outdive the Zero. Wildcat pilots, in general, would want to avoid the turning fight with the Zero. That would not be their fight. The Wildcat with its 650 cal machine guns, heavy body armor, heavy armor around the engine cowling, preferred head-on attacks, frontal attacks, and it would just basically plow through that Zero. The air battle of August 30th is a resounding victory for Smith and his pilots. They shoot down 14 of the 22 attacking Zeros. The Japanese bombers the Zeros were protecting retreat before reaching Guadalcanal. Believing the engagement is over, Smith sets course for Henderson Field. But there are two more deadly Zeros just ahead. August 30th, 1942. Three weeks into the battle for Guadalcanal, Japanese aircraft are on the attack. Marine fighter pilot John L. Smith has killed three enemy Zeros. Captain Smith is RTB, turning the base from his mission, thinking the mission's over, and he gains tally of two Zeros that have just strafed Henderson Field, so strafing his home. So the natural pilot tendency, what does he do? He's gonna roll in and attack those guys that just attacked his home. Smith is outnumbered once again, but he's high above the Zeros and they haven't spotted him yet. The Zeros are here. Smith is here, 800 feet above the enemy. He's hoping a steep diving turn will put him on the Zero's tail before they can react. Smith rolls inverted and dives towards the enemy. He levels out at six o'clock low, below and behind the trailing zero, positioned perfectly for the kill. The zero takes evasive action. He breaks hard left. But Smith has anticipated the move. He stays right with him, raking the enemy with his 50 cows. Cutting his speed and breaking back right, the Japanese pilot hopes to make Smith overshoot. But Smith chops power and stays in trail. The Zero is directly in the sights of a Marine ace. A final burst from Smith's Wildcat seals his fourth kill of the day. It's a victory for Captain Smith and inspiration to his men. He led by example. He would be the first one to roll in on a zero formation, and his guys would follow him to the gates of hell because of that, because they knew he was putting his tail on the line uh, every time. Smith and the Cactus Air Force have delivered a staggering blow in what is becoming a drawn-out brawl. The American pilots can only fly by day. 
they lack the radar and navigation aids that enable night fighting. The Japanese Navy had perfected night fighting in the 1930s using powerful optics and range finders. Crews were trained to work in total darkness. The Guadalcanal campaign developed into this extraordinary situation of a change of sea control every 12 hours. The Americans controlled in daylight thanks to their aircraft in Henderson Field. But every time the sun went down, the Japanese ruled the waters off Guadalcanal. After dark, the Japanese Navy controls the slot, a wide channel that runs from Guadalcanal to the Japanese base on Rabaul. The Japanese supply ships arrive with such regularity that the Marines nickname them the Tokyo Express. By early September, a month into the campaign, the Japanese have landed over 20,000 new ground troops on Guadalcanal, deployed against 23,000 U.S. Marines and Army soldiers. The Allied forces advance slowly across the mountainous island. But the Japanese launch large-scale counterattacks, supported by air and naval bombardment. They came in August, they came in September, they came in October, they came in November, and each time an increasing force and with increasing desperation, trying to inflict a decisive loss on the United States. While Japanese ground assaults can't stop the pilots at Henderson Field, constant air combat, primitive conditions, and rampant disease take their toll. They were constantly having to refurbish the airfield in order to be able to operate out of it constantly fending off attacks. They had malaria, dry rot, jungle conditions, which wreaks havoc on aircraft and maintenance. Old hands like John L. Smith are eventually rotated out, but before he leaves Guadalcanal, Smith scores 19 kills and is awarded the Medal of Honor. Many of the new Cactus Air Force pilots are green replacements, like Marine Second Lieutenant Jefferson DeBlanc, the 21-year-old Cajun from Lockport, Louisiana, enters combat not long after his first flight in an F-4F Wildcat. I had less than 10 hours of flying time in the fighter I was going to fight with against the Japanese. January 31st, 1943, six months into the battle for Guadalcanal, Jeff DeBlanc will get an accelerated course in air-to-air -air combat. He's about to launch into one of the most famous dogfights of the campaign. DeBlanc leads a flight of eight Wildcats escorting 12 SBD Dauntless dive bombers. The Douglas SBD Dauntless is the Navy's frontline carrier-based dive bomber. The plan is to attack Japanese supply ships heading for Guadalcanal. The flight hopes to intercept the convoy 250 miles from Henderson Field. You want to interdict that shipping as far away from the island as possible. If the mission failed and the shipping still existed or you weren't able to get all the shipping, you'd have an opportunity for a re-attack. Basically fly home, refuel, rearm, go back out and uh, try again. The jungle conditions and makeshift maintenance facilities have taken their toll on the Wildcats. Two planes radio they're having problems and want to turn back. DeBlanc protests. I picked up the mic and said, look, we need all of the guns we can get to get up there and protect these guys or else there's gonna be a lot of casualties. DeBlanc's plane is leaking fuel, but he's determined to hang in and protect the bombers. He knows he's on a one-way trip. Sure, I said, Please do this. I said, I'm not going to make it back. Get somebody coming up that area and look for me floating around in a, a rubber raft, because I'll be there. The sharks will be there with me, too. So give me a break. That's what I said. As they reach the target area, the American SBD Dauntless dive bombers descend, circling for targets. Suddenly, Two Japanese peat float planes dive down from high above on the slow, vulnerable SBDs. 
de Blanc sees the float planes closing on the Dauntlesses and rolls out to his left. Staff Sergeant Jim Felleton follows. They arc down to cut off the attack. De Blanc opens the throttle, gaining on the two enemy fighters. Then a brilliant stream of tracers rips out from one of the Pete's rear gunners, screaming straight at him. January 31st, 1943, six months into the Guadalcanal campaign. Marine Second Lieutenant Jefferson de Blanc has been protecting American bombers assigned to attack a Japanese supply convoy. Now he's diving to save the bombers from two Japanese Pete floatplane fighters. As he approaches, the Pete's lethal rear guns open fire. In a float plane, the rear gun is naturally a crack shot. If you ever get float planes in your side out there, don't try to go up to them to shoot, because that rear gun is murder, and he'll get you. Although it's a biplane, the Mitsubishi F-1 MP can more than hold its own in a fight. It has an excellent turning radius and is armed with two machine guns in the wings and a 7.7 millimeter tail gun. Tracers stream past de Blanc's canopy. He skids left and right to avoid the fire coming from the nearest Japanese gunner. He's using a lot of uh, rudder and aileron to basically slide his airplane back and forth to try and not uh, allow a steady bead by that tail gunner. De Blanc carefully lines up on the Pete's tail and fires. The heavy 50 caliber rounds tear through the float plane. Opening up his 1,200 horsepower Wildcat engine, de Blanc swiftly closes on the second Pete. His tracers rip into the Pete's fuel tanks. The burst caught him dead center, and his plane caught fire. He, he exploded, actually. De Blanc pulls skyward to resume his escort mission. He spots a swarm of airplanes approaching fast. They're Japanese Oscar fighters. The Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar is a frontline fighter for the Japanese Army Air Force. The Oscar is just as fast as the Wildcat and far more maneuverable. But the Wildcat can take more punishment and carries six machine guns to the Oscars too. The Oscars bore in full throttle, bent on attacking the dive bombers. But they have target fixation and don't spot de Blanc. The target is the prize, so become focused on that prize, you start to lose your peripheral vision and your actually situational awareness around you. De Blanc is here. The Oscars are here, streaking above de Blanc. De Blanc swings under the Oscars. He goes to max RPM pulls in below the enemy and fires at the lead. One Oscar falls. He's wounded and on fire, but escapes. The Oscar's wingman spirals up from the pack to figure out what's happening. De Blanc follows and swings onto his tail. The Oscar is squarely in his sights. It's Jeff DeBlanc's third confirmed kill of the day. DeBlanc's almost out of fuel, but he decides to stay and guard the SBDs. My job was to protect the what? The dive bombers. Now, I'm not a hero, but I have to live with my conscience. And if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, then I'm derelict in my duty. Suddenly, De Blanc realizes the other Oscars have broken off their attack on the bombers and are coming after him. The Oscars dive down to swarm De Blanc and Felton. 
Outnumbered and under attack, the two Americans instinctively fall back on a classic defensive maneuver, the thatch weave. It's a simple but effective two-plane tactic devised during the war by Naval Commanders Jimmy Thatch and James Flatley. Paired up in a buddy system, the planes fly 200 feet apart. If an enemy attacks a wildcat's tail, the two American fighters will turn toward each other. If the enemy follows, it will soon be targeted by the second plane. So by turning into each other, crossing flight paths, they force that bandit to pick one fighter or the other. And once they pick that fighter, that adversary aircraft is now vulnerable to an attack by the other fighter. For DeBlanc and Felaton, the thatch weave works. The Oscars are unable to attack without exposing themselves to one of the Wildcat's guns. But Felaton swings his Wildcat too wide and suddenly finds himself in the crosshairs of a trailing Oscar. Bullets chew into Felaton's engine. The Marine kicks his wounded Grumman into a wide left turn to get out of range. He bails out. With the mutual support of the weave now gone, an Oscar dives in on DeBlanc's tail. DeBlanc tries to shake off the enemy, but the nimble Oscar easily stays lodged in the six o'clock position. Then DeBlanc's squadron mate, Jim Seacrest, who has been with the bombers, comes to the rescue. DeBlanc is here, Seacrest is here, heading straight on. He is going to streak in directly over DeBlanc's canopy to get to the Oscar. Seacrest almost takes off DeBlanc's tail, but the move works. The Oscar pulls away. When DeBlanc looks up, both Seacrest and the Oscar are gone. I said, that's enough. I'm going home, and I couldn't understand why I'm still fighting these guys, because I'm going to be a dead man. I turned back, and I streaked for home full throttle. I don't care if it's using all the gas I have left. Night is falling. DeBlanc's fuel state is critical. He climbs to join the SBDs. They've delivered punishing blows to the Japanese and are heading home. But before he rejoins the bombers, he spots two more Oscars on his tail, closing fast. January 1943, the skies over Guadalcanal. Marine fighter pilot Jefferson DeBlanc is in trouble. Two agile Japanese Oscar fighters are tearing in from three o'clock high. Even though he's low on fuel, DeBlanc knows he must challenge the Oscars and draw them away from the American bombers. DeBlanc pulls a long right climbing turn into the enemy and calls on the best tactic for his Wildcat. He attacks head on. I'm the one that's climbing, and these guys are the one coming down, but very shallow when they saw me to steep in the dive. And when they steep in the dive, I cut loose. And he, he blew up. I caught, I caught the pipes that said it. The whole thing blew up. The Japanese fighter disintegrates, nearly blinding DeBlanc in the flying debris. His engine separated and went past me, separated and turning. Weird looking. I'd never had that before. And of course, there's nothing but debris in front of me, which I ran through. And it hit my, my prop, and it hit the wings. It did knock me out, it did knock me out, but I still had control, and it still was running, my engine was running. When DeBlanc regains his senses, he sees the second Oscar pulling in steeply behind him. He was looking at me as if that's a dead man I'm coming after, because I'm going to blow him right out of the sky. And when he came on down that way, we were both diving towards the sea. And I knew good and well with the Grumman, there's only one protection I have, flying straight. I couldn't do it because he can overtake me. Pulling up, I couldn't do it because he had me broadside. Over here, when you pull up, then you're going to stall and come down, he can get you there. 
So with only one option that I have to have is the option is to fool him. De Blanc forces his Wildcat into an aerial skid. In effect, he's slamming on his brakes, trying to force the Zero to overshoot. When I skidded, then he, uh, he was coming too fast. I straightened out to just let him go. We were wingtip to wingtip. The Oscar pilot tries to duplicate the skid, bleeding speed to stay on the Wildcat's tail. He fished still, and he couldn't do it. He went right past it. I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I could recognize that man today. And you say, you're crazy, man. Well, when you kill somebody during war, and you see him, you'll witness what I'm talking about. With the Oscar now at point-blank range, a single burst destroys the fighter. It's DeBlanc's fifth confirmed kill of the day. He's an ace in one afternoon. But his sense of triumph is fleeting. His eyes race over his instruments. He checks his watch. The instant I looked at my watch, a 7.7 .7 Japanese bullet came over there and knocked my wristwatch off my wrist. Well, that kind of scared me. Now DeBlanc is squarely in an Oscar's sights, taking hits to his engine, prop, and cockpit. Only the Wildcat's armor plate is keeping him alive. He kept firing. The bullets were coming past the engine and hit, hitting at the prop area, which, of course, is messing my prop up. Pretty soon he hit the engine and she caught fire. Then I knew I was in trouble and I bailed out. DeBlanc hits the water and swims to an enemy-held island. Natives pick him up and barter him to a friendly tribe for a sack of rice. Most people cannot price out their exact amount of money they are worth. But I know exactly how much I am worth. One 10-pound sack of rice. Second Lieutenant de Blanc is an amazing figure in marine aviation. He lives to tell this whole tale, comes back out, and rightly so, earned the Medal of Honor for his mission. By February 1943, the ragtag Cactus Air Force has fought the best of Japanese aviation to a virtual standstill. Tokyo decides the costs of trying to win Guadalcanal have been too great. The Guadalcanal campaign lasted officially six months from uh, August of 1942 into February of 43, at which time uh, Tokyo decided to uh, withdraw the forces remaining there. Over 11,000 Japanese troops are quickly evacuated. 20,000 others have died in combat or succumbed to disease and starvation. Nearly 6,000 Americans were killed or wounded. It's a major victory. Guadalcanal becomes a launching point for the Allied thrust across the Pacific. But on April 7th, 1943, the Japanese attempt final revenge, a last desperate attack on American convoys supplying Guadalcanal and the Allied effort. They launch a large scale air offensive from their bases on the northern Solomon Islands, as well as from four aircraft carriers. The massive strike force numbers over 200 planes. Near Guadalcanal, four Wildcats led by young First Lieutenant James Sweat are on routine patrol over the American convoys. We were circling around and whatnot, and finally uh, Smiley Burnett of uh, 214 uh, hollered that, uh, my God, there's, uh, there's millions of them. We looked at her and thought, holy smoke, there, there, there is millions of them. They were just like mosquitoes. And we thought, oh, God, here's we four airplanes and 75 or 80 Japanese dive bombers heading for us, along with about 150 uh, zeros. The Japanese formation is here. Sweat's fighters are below them, here, about eight miles away. 
the enemy hasn't spotted the Wildcats. Sweat climbs towards the Japanese Val dive bombers. Modeled after the German Stuka, the Aichi D-3A2 Val dive bomber is a mainstay of the Japanese carrier fleet. Packing machine guns on each wing and 7.7 millimeter rear gun. The dive bomber's tactic is dive steeply from 15,000 feet, accelerate to 300 miles per hour, release their bombs at smokestack level, and head for home. Eager to get his first kill, Sweat pulls away from the other F-4Fs and looks for a target. Three valves nose over to begin their dive bombing run on the American ships below. Sweat streaks down behind them. Suddenly, the rear gunner unleashes a stream of tracer fire directly towards Sweat. April 7th, 1943, Japan has launched a last ditch effort to avenge its humiliation at Guadalcanal. Marine Lieutenant James Sweat pursues three Japanese Val dive bombers attacking an Allied shipping convoy. The Val's rear gunners fire up at Sweat's Wildcat. Then, a single burst from 300 yards ignites the lightly armored Val's fuel lines. It's Sweat's first kill. I just picked one and just gave him a squirt and he flamed it like crazy. Sweat closes in on a second valve. The bomber's right wing is riddled by the first burst. A second shot rips the fuselage. Sweat has two kills in as many minutes. But almost immediately, Sweat finds himself in a shootout with the third bomber's tail gunner. 7.7 millimeter bullets zip past the Wildcat. But once again, Sweat's incendiary rounds hit fuel. Then, a violent explosion off his left wing. It's friendly fire. Anti-aircraft flak has blown a hole in his Wildcat. Sweat yanks his fighter out of the dive. I was number one, scared. Number two, frightened. Number three, ready to bail out of that darn thing. Then you couldn't believe how nervous I was. Sweat keeps climbing, ready to call it a day. But he spots a line of valves immediately in front of him. They've dropped their bombs and are hightailing for home. In spite of his battle damage, Sweat closes on the valves from behind. He lines one up and fires. It's kill number four. I was down below them and uh, so that the rear gunner couldn't shoot me. And when I fired my guns, I'd just stick the nose up a little bit and give a quick blast. And isn't that fantastic how they had <laughs> burn? The uncompromising discipline of the Japanese naval aviators dictates that they stay in formation and not take evasive action. Each one of them went down in turn as I was chasing them like this and uh, shooting and uh, it only took uh, two or three rounds per gun, and boy, it just ripped them up uh, something awful, and they'd flame just like that. A fifth victim drifts into the Wildcat's gun sights. The rear gunner leaps for his life moments before his plane plummets toward the ocean. On his first combat mission, the Marine rookie has become an ace in less than 15 minutes. 
Incredibly, the surviving valves hold formation. Stunned at his luck, Sweat pilots his Wildcat onto the tail of a sixth valve, downing it with a brief burst. Like a lion hunting panicked prey, Sweat continues within the pack of valves, lining up yet another victim. A smoking death roll marks his seventh kill. No longer scared, the Marine is starting to feel invincible. Talk about overconfidence, uh, that was me. As he sizes up an eighth victim, Sweat throws caution overboard. I was aimed right straight for the rear gunner, and I flew right into that damn gun. He just blasted my windshield and me and everything else. Sweat is cut from the shattered glass, but fires a final burst and kills the Val's gunner at close range. I can still see his eyes right now, the, the, the terror in his eyes while he was shooting at me. And when I fired back, he fell down into the cockpit. Shocking. But with no ammo in his crippled aircraft, Sweat knows the next kill is likely to be him. He hit my oil cooler and uh, disabled my engine because the oil pressure just dropped like a ton of bricks. And I thought, uh-oh, I've got to get the heck out of here. Sweat's engine begins to fail. He decides to ditch off nearby Florida Island. Just about, uh, oh, half a mile or so offshore, my engine froze. The prop stuck up like a middle finger. And uh, so I made a uh, put to let my flaps come down and they didn't, only one side worked. This flight uh, didn't work at all for some stupid reason. Probably the hole in my ring. Sweat makes an emergency landing. But upon impact with the water, his head strikes the control panel, breaking his nose. Worse, he's trapped in his sinking plane. I made a water landing and uh, went down about 25, 30 feet with the with the airplane, my shoulder strap was caught on the, the boat release hook right up over my right shoulder. And uh, man, I struggled to get out of that damned airplane. Reaching the surface, James Sweat is rescued and spends six days in the hospital. He returns to Guadalcanal to learn he's been nominated for the Medal of Honor. Today, along with the medal, Sweat holds the image of the Val's rear gunner. The look on that rear gunner's face when I killed him, I still see it night after night after night. James Sweat and his fellow airmen were eventually joined by over 70 aircraft from Henderson Field. The Cactus Air Force turned back the Japanese onslaught. Never again will the Japanese take the offensive in the Pacific. The men of the Cactus Air Force can take pride in their critical role in turning the tide in the Pacific War. And it was the kind of Americans who fought and prevailed under extraordinary circumstances at Guadalcanal who demonstrated not only to themselves but to their entire generation that they had what it would take to prevail in World War II. In the battle for the skies over Guadalcanal, the pilots of the Cactus Air Force flew more than 2,000 sorties, destroying over 425 Japanese planes and scoring a kill ratio of nearly four to one. The legacy of the pilots of the Cactus Air Force is absolutely amazing. We still study the battles. The lessons learned from Guadalcanal in 1v1 air combat are nearly as true today as they were then. The battle for Guadalcanal was a defining moment in Marine Corps history. Led by men like John L. Smith, Jeff DeBlanc, and James Sweat, 
this group of flyers overcame the worst of circumstances to send the best pilots of the Imperial Japanese Navy and Air Force to the bottom of the sea.